Welcome to Police K9 Radio. Rich, what's going on? Can we start off with a little bit of a rant today? Have an issue with dogs and children. Okay, which part? Are we having issues with the children or the dogs? Uh, the handlers. Okay. Uh, we're having an issue with the handlers. And uh, you and I have talked about this in the past uh, frequently. Uh, I think everybody knows at this point that we raise dogs to put into police work. Uh, frequently, when uh, agencies come to buy a dog from us, one of the first questions we get is, how's the dog going to be with a wife and kids, husband and kids, whichever situation is going on? How's the dog going to be with the family? And specifically, hey, how's the dog going to be with my kids? Go, first of well, all, well, well okay. first of all, let me fill in this blank. I don't have a volunteer child that I throw into the room yet. With the, <laughs> but we are looking for one. So if you have an extra one, and you want, yeah, if you want to let us, so we can help answer these questions for everybody, um, then yeah, maybe we'll use somebody else's child. But we don't have a four-year-old that I can toss into a room with a dog and be like, hey, let's see how they interact, and that's dumb. Yeah. So for you guys out there and gals that are looking to get into law enforcement or be a handler. This is something you really need to seriously consider because if you have a family, if you have small children, you need to understand that uh, these police dogs are not selected based upon their ability to interact with children. You know, it, it's do we want it? Absolutely. Do we like to go do school demos? Absolutely. But just remember, we're looking for a specific animal that has a lot of traits that we're looking for, right? Environmentally stable, um, strong desire to play with toys, prey drive, uh, fight drive. Uh, dogs that we maybe have to put into an attic to go fight a, a three-time parolee that doesn't want to go back to prison, right? And then you guys want to go ahead and then take your dog home and then have them lounge around on the couch with kids and have kids crawl on top of them. And the reality is very few animals are going to be able to meet that criteria. And the problem is, on top of that, now you can look on social media. Like the world has gotten smaller, right? So we can get on YouTube, we can get on Facebook, Instagram, any of those things right now, and we can see 20 pictures of uh, really balanced dogs that are hanging around with kids. There's nice photos taken, the family photos taken with the fluffy shepherd that also happens to be a canine. And then everybody's like, hey, I'd like my dog to be in that same situation. Before the handler goes to pick out the dog, the family is saying, hey, make sure you get one that's going to be good for us. Uh, there's a lot of parameters that are going there. Um, and like you said, that's just not the reality. And that's not why you should be selecting a dog or what you should be selecting a dog based on. And then the bad thing is, is if you do select a dog and you try and shove that dog into a situation that it doesn't belong into, the, th the, the thing that gives is the child. The child ends up getting bit and your agency is not going to be thrilled with that. Um, your family is not going to be thrilled with that. And, and now you have this dog that's bitten a child. All those things, we can imagine what that turns into. Yeah, so here's what we recommend. When you get a brand new dog, um, that dog doesn't know you. You don't know it, right? You, you really don't have generally a good relationship in the beginning. And that there has to be trust that is earned. So what we recommend, if, uh, if you want to potentially integrate your dog down the road with your family, that isn't done on the front end. Um, we bring the dog in, uh, have a crate in the house, put the dog in a crate, uh, see how the dog reacts just being in the family environment, kids running around. Um, a lot of times if you see that dog and he's in the crate and a kid runs by and he does a quick circle, you know, or starts barking loudly, um, uh, high-pitched bark. You that's know, a sign. That's a sign. Yeah. Um, and I, I think what happens is we want to integrate way too fast. And you start feeling comfortable with them in a couple of weeks, and then you want to integrate them with the family. Um, don't do that. Put them in a crate. See how they react. And then when you go on walks, if you're going to take your dog out, like a lot of times there's another family dog, you know, have your, your spouse get the family dog. You have your canine. Kids can go along for the walk. But we really don't recommend the interaction or the petting or, you know, or any kind of manipulation uh, with the dog, with the kids around, you know, where they're jumping on them or anything like that. For God's sake, please don't do that. Um, another thing you can do, though, to, to develop a good, re good kind of initial meeting is if your dog is outside in a kennel, what we recommend is kids and the wife or the husband go out and just say hi, throw some kibble into the, into the, into the kennel, and then walk away. So you're starting a, a good association with the kids. And you can also judge by the reaction of the dog that way as well. Yeah, and I think it's good to keep in mind that kids do weird stuff, right? Like we train a lot of pet dogs uh, all the time. And, and 
it's not just a police dog thing. Matter of fact, we see it more in the pet dogs because the police dogs at least have some control. The pet dogs are just running amok a lot of times. And kids do weird things. They run fast. They smell like food. They always have some version of a food item smeared on their hands, their face. They like to shove Legos in dogs' nose. They like to take the dog's toys, the ball, the bones, all those things. Mm-hmm. And dogs start to think kids are a problem. And they see them as peers. They're not in the hierarchy. You know, they, they don't control what they do. They're not typically part of the feeding process, the walking process. So the dog starts to look at the child as a peer. And in the dog world, a peer can correct another peer with a quick nip to the neck. Everybody walks away. But kids don't have a bunch of disconnective tissue on their neck. Not usually. <laughs> not usually. I've seen your kids. They do have, they some do have a little fur. folds right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's different. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, keep that in mind. Like if a, if a dog corrects a child, it stitches now we're dealing with euthanasia, departments to get, you know, all that stuff happens. So long story short, the priority of your canine should not be to get along with your children. Yeah. And so if you're thinking about getting into this profession, that's something that you're definitely going to want to consider. Yep. Good. Off that topic, what do we got going on tonight? Well, we got a lot going on. Do we want to talk about any of our sponsors before we get into that? Well, we know that uh, we have hits coming up, but I think that's something that's exciting that uh, our two uh, our guests tonight are going to be yes. teaching or at least present at hits. So we'll talk to them about hits when that comes on. Um, Nookshuk hooked us up. They gave yep. us a couple new shirts. Uh, pretty excited to be working with Nookshuk. Those guys, uh, we now have half a dozen agencies out here that are feeding all of their dogs in Nookshuk and they're doing really good. We have at least 30 um, pet clients that are feeding their dogs in Nookshuk. We have everything from the Marine down to the, uh, the puppy food. We have currently in our home right now, a brand new giant schnauzer puppy who's on the puppy program. Our adult dog is on the adult program. We have four Malinois and a shepherd that are all using the adult program and uh, all the dogs are flawless with their nutrition. Everything's going great. We could not be happier uh, than we are working with the Nookshuk and their food. Yeah, it's working dog food. And if, if we've had dogs that have issues with all kinds of like skin issues or um, they won't put weight on or, you know, their stool is always runny or, or whatever. And we find that the majority of the time when we go on a quality food like a Nookshuk, we, we usually don't have that issue. Yeah, it goes away right away. It really does. Awesome. Who do we have on tonight? You, you tell me. All right. Uh, tonight, we're excited. Uh, actually, they're waiting for us in the wings, and they can come off a of mute now. We have them muted, and we're going to bring them on. We have Dr. Lauren DeGrief, mm-hmm. uh, who's joining us, and Dr. Michelle Mon, who's also joining us uh, from different parts of the world. I think, Michelle, you're out in Delaware, and Lauren in Florida. Is that right? That's correct. Awesome. Uh, we'll start, since we've had Michelle on in the past, and our uh, listeners know who she is or should know who she is, we're going to start with the newbie, Dr. Lauren DeGrief. If you can tell us what you're doing currently in the canine world and the science world and combining those things uh, and, and um, kind of inform our listeners what's new with you. Sure. Um, so I'm a chemist. I um, specifically research odor for the purpose of canine detection. Um, I've been a researcher for in this field for a good number of years, well over 10 years. I don't feel like aging myself. Um, I'm currently an associate professor at Florida International University. Um, I have a whole bunch of grad students. We do all kinds of cool projects. Um, one of the things that we're recently uh, been looking into and we're going to talk about tonight is detection of fentanyl and coming up with a safe training aid for it. And um, not to burst anybody's bubble, but we haven't figured it out yet, but we'll talk about it. Um, and then we also work with explosives, human remains, um, even uh, uh, oil spill remediation. So we do a wide range of things. One of my projects uh, is um, looking at buried IEDs and looking at how the odor moves up to the top. I have another one that is trying to figure out when live scent becomes dead scent. So when do living people die and start smelling like dead people? Um, we're going to start looking at designer benzos, all kinds of fun stuff. That's uh, are you doing all that at the same time, or do you farm some of that out to your grad students? Uh, yeah, are, are, oh, that's. I don't do anything. I just tell them what to do, <laughs> <laughs> and then fix the problems. Uh, but yeah, I have a good number of um, awesome PhD students that do all these projects. Great, Michelle. What's new with you? And are you guys crossing over on stuff? Kind of always. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, um, how many grad students do you have right now, Lauren? I currently have nine. 
Holy it is a uh, very a lot. It is a lot. I'm probably getting a tenth in the Pretty fall. Cool. Um, although they told me not to have any more. My grad students told me not to have any more graduate student babies. So we'll see. Wow. Congrats. That's that's phenomenal. And I'm sure <laughs> you all will be ridiculously productive with that many grad students. Can, that is the goal. Before you go on, what is what brings a grad student to you? What is their area of study that lands them with you? It's Lauren's milkshake. Oh, techni- <laughs> brings, brings the grad students the to the yard. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yes. Uh, they're, so at FIU, they are all in the forensic chemistry program. So some of them are masters in forensic science, but most of them are PhDs in chemistry. Um, some of them got stuck with me. And some of them chose me and some of them specifically came to FIU because they wanted to do dog related research. So it kind of runs the gamut. Awesome. Michelle, sorry, we cut you off. I I asked you to talk about yourself and then we talked about other stuff. So I'd much rather talk about other stuff, Um, (laughs) but I'll I'll do a super quick intro. Um, My bio is not nearly as impressive as Dr. DeGriefs, but um, I've had the pleasure of working with Lauren for quite a while now. I'm not going to say a decade because that ages us both, Um, but I'll say quite a bit. Uh, Lauren used to work at the Naval Research Lab um, in DC, and that is pretty close to where I work, which is Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. And I am there on an army base, um, basically as a contract research scientist, um, meaning that I you know, perform research, development, test, and evaluation on anything from commercial off-the-shelf canine training aids to um, performing independent verification and validation of some of those products that are out on the market for canine um, and have certain claims. And we will go and then verify if those claims are um, accurate. And um, we have all sorts of projects that span from canine decontamination to um, advanced training in sort of austere environments. So um, we do whatever we're told. Um, We do whatever the uh, requirement is from the warfighter. And so there has to be an end user requirement, meaning someone comes to us and says, I need X, Y, or Z. And then we figure out how to make that happen. Um, And one of the ways we figure that out is by pairing up with the experts. And so um, Lauren is certainly known as an expert in her field. Um, There's a bunch of other canine scientists that we also work with that are just phenomenal collaborators and um, experts in their specific areas of canine. And so we try and get um, that scientific community together. And once we get the right people in the right room, um, then we can do some really phenomenal uh, work to, you know, advance canine detection. I think, obviously, we, we're having you on because of the fentanyl issue that's going on nationwide. Um, and I, I think, honestly, we're like nobody really knows where to start with this problem. Uh, a lot of uh, canine handlers are finding it all over the place. Uh, we have some pretty prolific. Uh, handlers that are finding it in the jail, they're finding it out on the street, they're finding it in large amounts. Um, some of the dogs are starting to essentially train themselves to find it because it's on uh, every load, right? I mean, they're finding it with everything. Um, so I think we are trying to find the safest and most effective way to train detection of fentanyl. And you guys seem like you might have a key to that. I have opinions on it. I don't know if I have an answer. (laughs) Well, I think it's good to start with opinions. Did you do do any work with uh, the Highway Patrol, California Highway Patrol? I know they were. I did. They've been amazing. Yes, they've been fantastic. It didn't actually work, (laughs) but it Mm -hmm. is not California Highway Patrol. It's because the question is, it is difficult. Um, But yeah, we've been working with California Highway Patrol uh, recently. We thought we came up with a mimic, which is basically um, we took a key odorant from fentanyl. Um, We spent a couple of years looking at, we had got like reference grade. So um, fentanyl I can buy uh, with our DEA license, figured out what was, what that smelled like. So what chemicals come off of it. 
And then we went around and got um, a number of confiscated materials and looked for common chemicals. We found one. It was a fantastic target. It's great. Um, I have another project where I am uh, have developed a way to detect that target in the vapor phase instrumentally. So you could go bring the instrument to the field and ca- like instrumentally sniff and find that chemical, and that would be presumptive test for um, fentanyl. And so we assumed that would work really well with the dogs. We were less correct. The instrument, great. Dogs, we have to fine tune that a bit. Um, But California Highway Patrol, we sent them the key odorant that we thought was the target. And then we sent them some real fentanyl in tads. Everything was done in tads. Um, And we found that the dogs had a very hard time being imprinted on the chemical that we sent them. So what we learned from this study is that the even though that that key chemical was in all the fentanyls, it doesn't matter if the dogs can't smell it. So we figured out that the dog actually doesn't have a very good threshold. It doesn't have a very low threshold for that chemical. So eventually they were able to imprint the dog on it, but we had to increase the amount a lot. And then they were able to, once they imprinted the dog, they could back off and bring it down but the dogs really never readily transferred that to the fentanyl. But we had another half, so the dogs just went to two. The other set of dogs did readily get trained to real fentanyl and then obviously detect real fentanyl. So that tells us that there is something there that the dogs can detect. It's just not what we wanted it to be, unfortunately. Can we can we go back uh, yep. a, a couple squares for... We'll pretend it's for the listeners, but for us, can you explain what fentanyl is um, and then like what it's made of, what its purpose in life is, uh, and yeah. then we'll move on from there. Sure. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. There's lots of opioids. Um, everybody's heard of the opioid epidemic by now, um, which in brief started due to the overprescription of things like oxycodone. Um, and then fentanyl is uh, used as an uh, analgesic, so it's used as an anesthesia um, legally and continues to be, which makes it a Schedule II drug um, because it does have a legal use, a medical use. Um, however, it's also it's very cheap, and there is a way to clandestinely clandestinely is that a word? We're gonna say it is. We're gonna clandestin clandestinely produce fentanyl. So it is produced in um, clandestine labs in China as well as in Mexico, and then it is um, smuggled across the borders or shipped through our ports. Um, And it is um, extremely potent, significantly more potent than morphine. Um, So it's a big danger. Um, I've gotten asked before, so heroin is also an opioid. It's a Schedule 1, so it doesn't, it's not considered as having a medical use. Um, I've gotten asked before, well, if they're both opioids, if the dogs are trained to detect heroin, they'll just detect fentanyl. And Unfortunately, to go a little bit into the chemistry of it, the molecule of fentanyl and the molecule of heroin don't look the same. And what that means to a canine handler is that if that means that they don't, the molecules don't fall apart and give off odor that are similar. So usually a drug, let's call it, let's go with cocaine for the moment because it's the most um, well studied. The molecule of cocaine is big and big molecules don't like to go into the vapor phase they like to stay solid if it's not vapor or gas or whatever you want to call it it means you can't smell it so when you have a cup of coffee in front of you you are not smelling the liquid you're smelling the vapors that come off the liquid the chemicals that are coming off that coffee Um, so um, scientists have established that one of the key vaporous compounds that come off of cocaine is something called methyl benzoate So they did a study really similar to what I described with CHP, except it was successful, um, where they trained the dogs on methyl benzoate and the dogs then found cocaine. In case anybody's curious, methyl benzoate has a really nice fake grape smell. It smells like Dimetap or something like some kind of grape medicine. Uh, Grape popsicles, I guess, would be also. Um, So for those of you who have not sniffed your cocaine recently. um, (laughs) So that's what we were trying to do with, with fentanyl. Um, But going back to the heroin, so because the molecule of heroin and the molecule of fentanyl don't look the same, 
they don't break down and give off chemicals that are the same. So there's nothing similar. The chemicals that make up the odor of heroin and the chemicals that make up the odor of fentanyl are unfortunately not the same at all, at all. So heroin has a vinegary smell. Fentanyl has, I don't know, I don't, I try to keep my face away from it. <laughs> if, if we're getting clandestinely produced fentanyl from China or South America, Mexico, somewhere around there, when it makes it to the United States, are all of those, if we threw the, the Chinese tablets and the, the, you know, the South American tablets, if we threw those all on the table, are they all the, the same? Are, do those all smell the same, look the same, act the same, or are they different from one another? So there, fundamentally, there is a molecule of fentanyl, so there is some odor that is in common. So we did a study where we looked at a bunch of clandestine fentanyl from different sources. So we did um, stuff from the DEA, and that was border as well as, uh, I don't actually know, so I know half were border, and I'm not sure where the other half were, non-border. Um, and then we did some from Maryland State Crime Lab that were more um, common like confiscated materials from drug busts. Um, and we did find some compounds that were common. Um, and that's how we chose the compound that we thought would, the dogs would be interested in. Um, however, it's also really important to know that all those manufacturers are going to have other odors. So it's the same for any of your training aids. It could be explosives. It could be narcotics. It could be anything. There, every different source where it's made, it's going to smell a little bit like where it was made. So if you get three different chilies, they may all have the same ingredients, but they're, you're gonna have you done maybe um, different proportions of the ingredients, or maybe your house has a smell, and it, or maybe you some of the chili was packaged in a glass container and some was packaged in plastic, so there's gonna be extra smells in there, even if the ingredients are the same. So yeah, all those different, whether it's from the pills from China um, or some other kind of powder, uh, you are going to have differences in the odor and hopefully similarities also that your dogs can key in on those similarities is what we're shooting for. So if we took prescribed U.S. grade, I don't know, medical fentanyl, uh, we took the South American fentanyl and we took the Chinese fentanyl and we threw all those all three in a bag, there should be something that the dog should get from all three of those that would l allow it to generalize that, that as an odor. Correct. However, what we have working in our benefit is that the m more clandestine the manufacturer, the more odor. So it would probably be very, very difficult for them to for the dogs to find the pharmaceutical. It'd probably be below their threshold, unless we're talking like a mass pile of pharmaceutical grade fentanyl, which you'd probably want to find, because I don't feel like people should have mass quantities of pharmaceutical grade fentanyl. Well, and on on our side, on the law enforcement side. It's legal, right? So that's always, or that's the dilemma, is it's a prescribed medication. Granted, most people aren't right. carrying around prescribed fentanyl in their car. Um, so there are, yeah, and obviously CHP is one of those, but there are agencies now across the nation that are actively going out and searching specifically for fentanyl, which is mm -hmm. a prescribed medication. Yeah, which I think would go into their investigation, right? Like, that would be something you'd be asking the person you're detaining, right? Yeah, do you, have any, do you have any prescription medications? What are they? You know, do you have a legal right to possess the fentanyl? And then, you know, proceed with the dog and the sniff, which I think would give you maybe your probable cause. But it, this is all, like, new territory for us, right? right? So I think, it, and that's, that's part of the problem is industry-wide, we're, we're just still kind of figuring out how we're going to handle this thing. I, and I guess for, for the simple side, and Michelle, this is a question, well, for both of you, but... <laughs> Could I take all three of those sourced fentanyl tabs, chuck them in a tad, and just start using that as my training method? Well, Lauren, I mean, Lauren's done the, the studies on this, so I'll let her answer. But in terms of a safety profile, um, yes. So the tad... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug the TAD because I really like it, and you don't plug it enough, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. So the TAD is, if I throw something that's dangerous, like a drug, into the TAD, seal it all up well, I'm now protected from fentanyl. It's not going to cause me or the dog any problems as long as the lid stays sealed. Yeah, and with proper use, that is definitely true. Um, the Army did a, um, a small research study on using benzyl fentanyl in the TAD and measured the containment abilities of the TAD um, with benzyl fentanyl because that's sort of a less regulated uh, analog 
uh, or derivative of fentanyl, and um, the the tad contained the benzyl fentanyl after just ridiculously harsh conditions that um, the the scientists were putting it under. So freezing, heating, um, shaking, all sorts of different um, sort of perturbations, if you will, and that um, the uh, that benzyl fentanyl was not coming out of the tad. Yeah, and actually for our listeners that have been in a cave, what, can you just explain what the TAD is? Yes, uh, so the TAD is the training aid delivery device. It is a containment system uh, and odor delivery system in one. And so that was a device that I invented during my course um, as a research scientist at DEVCOM or the Army. And um, it's now a commercialized item that is sold through Psycanine of which I own a um, minority partnership in. And where all right now, if uh, is Psycanine the only place we can grab tads if we want them? Or, no, or? please do not get them from Psycanine. Please go to Ray Allen. Um, <laughs> because if they go to Psycanine, then I have to fill the order. Um, and I don't have time for that. So uh, Ray Allen is probably the best place to, to get them these days. Uh, and to build on that, before I go back and ask the uh, fentanyl question again to Dr. DeGrief, um, are you still marketing the no odor odor? I don't forget what it's called. The, the, the so odor the, that the doesn't odor. replicate anything Isn't else. Odor? That's <laughs> the, the UDC, Lauren. Oh, the UDC. Um, so, Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the universal detector calibrant. I'm an enormous fan um, and proponent and user of the uh, the UDC. I know almost all of the academic labs are. And that was invented by a scientist down at uh, Florida International University, Dr. Katie Lynn, now Sloan, then Belts. Um, and so it's not a, I don't still know if it's like a no odor. What's that? Is it still unavailable to the, the masses? Ish, ish. Um, so there's a um, there's a company that sells a, a version of it um, that's for trainers. Basically, it's different concentrations of that um, chemical, one bromyl octane, and um, they sell a trainer's kit. And then um, I know that there's some places that are also selling the uh, Getsend tubes, which is an odor adsorption technology that is. Um, co-incubated or impregnated with the UDC odor. And so who's doing that? What's that? Precision is precision doing that? Who's doing the, uh, who's doing the get sent with UDC? Um, so psychanine will do it on a sort of case by case basis, but I'm pretty sure precision is doing it as well. Precision explosives. Okay. Hey, and real quick on the TADS, um, our detection guy, Chris Oliver loves to have fun with those. Um, you can actually submerge them in water. It doesn't, the water doesn't get into the contents of the jar, but yet odor comes out, um, yep. which is like some space shuttle stuff going on here. Um, <laughs> a gas and, uh, membrane, that's all, that's all it is. But uh, that membrane is, is pretty, um, pretty special. And so solids and liquids are not able to permeate or, you know, diffuse through the, or diffuse across the membrane, whereas um, gas is. And so yeah, that's so, sort of the, the business end of the tad. Yeah, it's freaking awesome. So like he'll, he'll open the toilet tank and submerge it in the toilet tank, right? And then we had our dogs and they were, they were, they were banging it. That's now, cool. when you guys do this, I recommend do the tank of the toilet, not necessarily the bowl of the toilet. Oh, because you gotta, <laughs> yeah, you gotta be careful where you're reaching back in. That's right. Yeah. How committed are you to this? <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a, a great contingent of the uh, human remains detection community that will put the tad underwater and certain bodies of water to replicate, I guess, the odor of a submerged corpse. Um, and so, you know, it's just, I'm continually amazed by dogs detection ability, especially when the odor is, you know, buried or, um, in, you know, underwater or um, somehow just in the environment and dogs can pick out that signal from the noise. Um, and so I know Lauren does a lot of that work as well, but there's, um, uh, I don't know. I just feel like there, we haven't found nearly the limit of what these dogs are able to detect if we give them the right tools. No, totally agree. Uh, Dr. DeGree, back to you on that original question. Now, why can't I take those, all those tablets, toss them in the TAD and 
teach the dogs, hey, find this stuff and then we'll be good on the streets from here on out. You, de- you definitely can. You absolutely can. We, we did it. Um, the things to look out for, well, one <laughs> is that it's really expensive. So if you get the, re- the reference grade fentanyl, it, uh, the price just recently skyrocketed. When I bought it in 2019, I bought 100 milligrams for, a, I think, about $300. And when I went back to buy it again, it was 1000 so um that was a that was rough um there are other places to buy it i found a different place but that was disturbing um but it's still it's really expensive um if you get if you tra- this counts the same for any of your drugs if you are training on street drugs you need to be training on something really relevant because realistically speaking if that drug is cut with something there there's probably a lot more of that cutting agent than there is of the drug of interest so they're probably just learning the cutting agent which is fine if that's what you want your dogs to do like if you're cool with the dog, like if, with the, finding these particular types of tablets, go for it. Um, however, if they change the cutting agent, um, which they will do when they run out of one source and move to another, if your dog is only learning that one cutting agent, then they're not going to hit on the next thing. So that is the only thing to look out for. So using a reference grade where it's the pure is um, better, but then you have the expense issue. So it's a little bit... Um, I'm not always a huge proponent of mimics, but I think this is a is an argument for using a combination of a mimic as well as maybe a little have a little bit of the reference grade as well as using the confiscated. So the the dog have to know what's actually out there. I'm not saying that the dog should never see confiscated. I'm just talking for imprinting. You have to be careful. Sure. Is there not a pharmaceutical company out there that realizes that this is a problem that maybe they helped develop that they could possibly be willing to donate that, uh, I don't know, donate the drug to you guys to, to create this solution? You let me know when you find the people. I will tell you that the, you let me know when you figure out who will do that. Um, right now, I buy Which my stuff countries? from Lipomed. I, I won't. I won't ask what what business uh, specifically because I don't want to go down that and have us shut down by people more powerful than us. But is it being developed? Is it being made in United States pharmaceutical companies right now? Is there is there a U- U.S. pharmaceutical company that is making this? Yeah, what? there's also. You don't have to get it from the pharmaceutical company. Um, I've never tested it from the pharmaceutical company because I don't have an easy means to get that. I buy reference grades. So there's places that researchers and also um, agencies could purchase from. Um, one is Cayman Chemical. That's the most common. And they get they have all, all different drugs there. And there's also one called Lipomed, which I found doesn't have quite the selection, but it's cheaper. Um, and okay. I, I find similar odor off of both Cayman and Lipomed. Fentanyl. So, so can, I, can I bring up a point to discuss um, about training aids in general? So I think it's really important to note what Lauren just said about um, that mimics have a place and are, make really good types of training aids for certain targets like like cocaine, right? We're using methyl benzoate and that readily, the dogs that are trained on methyl benzoate readily transfer their detection capabilities to cocaine um, and however it's not you can't use the same technology or the same sort of methodological approach for every target material and so that comes to light in in um, threats like c4 for example so c4 explosive is a there has a very complicated headspace so that means the odor that's coming off of c4 is very complicated and it has um, at least five or six different odorants or those chemicals that are coming off of C4 that um, make its way you know, into the headspace and in your dog's nose. And if you just take any one of those chemicals and try and train the dogs to then spontaneously generalize to C4, it does not work. And so dogs really need all of the odorants that are within C4 in, in order to detect C4. And so that is, um, and, and that's, I think, why most of the C, commercial off the shelf C4 training aids 
don't have a very good um, like past performance or success record. So um, mimic stuff I think is ideal in a lot of ways because you know you're picking out just an odorant or two, and you can um, you know you can make those training aids and have them be you know either non-hazardous or not subject to the same regulations as the threat material. But the same approach does not work for every target. And then I think the other thing that we're hitting on is, um, or sort of like touching on subject wise, is the fact that there's not one target. That when we're talking, especially um, in narcotics and all of the different sort of street drug, street drug formulations that you'll find, um, the target is sort of always evolving, always changing, and it depends on who made it, when they made it, um, what resources they had when they made it, and uh, a dozen other things. So, um, you know, I, I try and recommend to people that they cross train with other agencies, that they try and get access to other people's training aids. Um, and seizures from, you know, various, uh, you know, arrests or what have you, so that the dog is getting a, um, is able to generalize to all of the different targets as that is a moving target. And so um, I don't know if, I mean, it, it would be really nice to be like, oh, this is the one training aid for the one thing we have to detect. Um, but I feel like in ex explosives and narcotics, that's not really the situation that we are dealing with. And I'd love to get um, Lauren's thoughts on that. That that was a lot of really good topics. Um, and we could we could talk about we could talk about commercial training aids for a very long time. Uh, Michelle and I worked on a project for several years, which God willing will be published eventually. I swear, uh, and hopefully in the next few months. Um, on commercial training aids. So I could talk about that forever, but that's not what you guys asked. But um, yeah, I think that... It's a good side note for us, though, because we are in the world, obviously, where we are trying to find the best training aid that we can use to condition the dogs to find the odor that we're looking for. Uh, and there's a lot of... Sure. There's a lot of buyer beware out there, yeah, right? Well, but, we, but we don't know what to believe because we're cops. Sure, or like and logistically, like in our explosives, like mm. TATP or something like that. Like we don't have agencies running around with certain right. things in their in their trunk. So, so um, just out of necessity, unless we can go to an explosive, you know, manufacturer and and be able to work with their with their product, like we're forced to potentially use some of these these mimic odors. So I would love to hear your opinion on that if. If maybe that's the only alternative, or are we really selling our dogs short in that area, and then and then also in the narcotics? Sure. So I'll give you. Um, we'll start with the really good news: is that TTP. You know, I said that like usually the molecule wants like cocaine. It wants to be a solid. It doesn't want to be in the gas phase. You can't smell cocaine itself. You smell methylbenzoate. We're very lucky. TTP is a solid, but it also is very happy being in the gas phase. So um, TATP smells like TATP. So that molecule that is in the gas phase and is in the solid is the same. And what that means is that it's okay. really easy to make a training aid. So that is by far the easiest training aid. Um, different manufacturers will have different pluses and minuses, but that is the, if you, and that's also something that people commonly need to buy, like they're not allowed to have. They might have C4, but they don't have TATP. So that is the safest one to go buy a commercial training aid of. Um, when you are purchasing okay. commercial training aids, you want to look for, and I'm going to tell you this has really not been done, but you want to look for third-party validation. So somebody needed to have green dogs or dogs that were at very least totally green to that odor, have trained them on it and show that they will cross over. It does not nearly mean as much if I have an explosive, a seasoned explosive dog and tell it to go find that TTP than it does if I have a new dog trained on TTP training aid, and then we'll go find the real. So that's that's really, really important. It's also important that somebody has looked at the chemicals in, like a chemist has looked at it, um, because you also need to know what other kind of junk is in there, because if there's more junk related to not the explosive in there than the explosive itself, then the dog is just going to learn the junk and not the, not the explosive. But 
Um, that being said, the TTP is the is the easiest thing to go. After that, it gets much more complicated. C4 is a great um, example. And there was a study that was done back in, I want to say the early 2000s by Ross Harper and um, Dr. Ken Furton. Not that, sorry, Dr. Ross Harper and Dr. Ken Furton, um, where they took dogs that already knew C4 and they put out some of those odorants to see which of the dogs would detect. And it was really interesting. I think they had six dogs and three chose compound A and three chose compound B. So not only is it difficult to mimic something that has multiple compounds in the headspace, but the dogs have their own opinions. So like if we'll go back to the chili, if I smell the chili, I might pick up on the cumin. And if Michelle smells the chili, she might pick up on, I don't make chili. I don't know why this is my example. Uh, what else is in it? The <laughs> cayenne pepper. Let's go tomatoes. Tomato. I don't know. Do you smell tomatoes? I don't know. Or tomato. Um, so the dogs kind of have a different difference of opinion also, which makes it a bit more challenging. Um, so it, it's, it's, they, they are challenging. They really do need to be third party validated. Um, but there is some, there is some value in it because it's really important when you imprint that you're imprinting on as pure of an odor as possible. So if you can get a commercial training aid that has been validated and you know, it will work, that's a really good way to imprint if you know it's a really pure odor and that, but you quickly have who should, to, who should validate the odor you, you, when you said that should be validated, who, if we're, if we want to make sure that we have a good product, who would be validating that? Somebody odor? that's not, doesn't have a stake in the company. Okay. Have somebody who doesn't have, are there, are there, are there mimics out there that are validated right now? Um, there will be if I could put a, well, sort of, kind of. There's a paper that will be published that will be helpful on TTP, um, a little bit on HMTD. This is something that I'm working on um, with a group called OSAC, which is under NIST. OSAC is um, where you write standards for forensic purposes, um, but they have taken over dogs and sensors. I don't know if any of you guys remember Swig Dog. And Swig Dog wrote, nice. yeah, okay, so uh, OSAC is, Swig Dog became OSAC. So um, OSAC is actually writing guidelines right now to validate training aids. So somebody like Michelle or somebody like myself or many other people out there can start validating these. Um, all I can say is proceed with caution and be very aware of anecdotal evidence or even scientific evidence from training aid manufacturers that have not been validated by somebody who doesn't have stake in the company. Yeah, and we're not, I mean, it doesn't, we're not here to talk about other businesses, but we have had anecdotal issues ourselves where the dogs were alerting on a mimic and didn't cross over. Yeah. And, and, so. And, you know, there are a variety of reasons that could happen. Um, and in lieu of third party, um, if you want to do some citizen science, I'm all for citizen science, but you just have to make sure that you, you know, really think it through. As Michelle said, the dogs are freaking smart. And um, setting up a dog test is hard because they're so smart and you, they can, you can screw it up without knowing it very, very easily. Um, so if, if, you know, there's something that you really want to know about and you really want to set up a trial, reach out to somebody like Michelle or somebody like myself, and we would be happy to look over your protocols, I'm sure, and kind of help you in that direction because um, she and I can't do all of the validation with unless people suddenly want to start, unless the government suddenly wants to start giving us a lot of money to do so. <laughs> well, and the hard part for us is, and I'm going to, I'm going to speak for Greg. Greg owns DTAC and he has somewhere in the area of 80 canines that he works with, right? On, in, in a given month, um, big cross section, but how do we break that down and decide like, Ooh, are these dogs doing it right? Are they not doing it? Right? Like, how do we, we can't use those dogs that are under his umbrella as the guinea pigs in this situation, right? Because they're they're well, in the field working. And there's so many imperfections, right? Like with how our aids have been handled, the differences in the dogs, the places they've been hidden. Like, and I don't want to go down this, this, uh, you know, I'm not a scientist. So the controlled study of, uh, and then even the, the, the variances in the handlers, right? Various in handlers, various in dogs, yeah. various in aids, environments. Um, but can you give us uh, some of the explosives that you think um, would be easy for mimics to you know, reproduce that odor per se, and then a couple that would be difficult that would be like, hey, if I had a, an explosives dog, 
you would definitely want to make sure that you're, you know, um, you and I, and I get like you want to use a cross section of the real material for all the dogs, but are there certain ones like we, we talked about TATP? You see that kind of crosses over kind of easier um, with the way that the odor is emanated. Um, and excuse my uh, my vernacular because I'm, I'm sure it's not not scientifically accurate. But anyway, just give us like a list of maybe some of the odors for our guys that that like hey these are the odors that you guys are definitely going to want to work on the real material versus a mimic. Michelle, do you have an opinion? Um, like you guys mentioned C4, you said how that's complex, right? Yeah, so for like yeah. the mimics, like that might be one that, you know, obviously that you might want to make sure it's the real material. And obviously we want to do all real material, but if I'm a, a handler and maybe I've got limited resources, like what are the ones I want to focus on? Well, I'll, I'll just add, so some of the terminology for this is still being worked out by that organization that Lauren mentioned. The um, And I think I'm using the wrong terminology. Um, so the, it's the organizational <laughs> um, scientific area committee, that's OSAC. Committees. Committees, OSAC, yeah. And so um, the, the language is really important here. Um, so when Lauren's saying that uh, the parent um, you know, the, the odor of TATP is the same odorant as the solid, um, and it makes a great training aid. It makes a great training aid in the odor absorption type of training aids. Is, is that you were, you were referring to Lauren? No, they're all pretty, that one's the easiest by far. There's nothing that's as easy as TATP. No, but I'm saying, I'm saying if you have, if it's anything um, other than odor adsorption, it's going to be controlled. Or like if it has to be rendered non-detonable in some fashion. Right. Yes, it's okay. the best non-detonable. Right. There's the easiest okay. to make a non-detonable. And there's a variety of ways of doing that, which I think is a whole nother another another podcast um but a whole variety of ways of making them yeah and so so i think it'd be hard for us to go out and say which ones are easy or or not easy targets to (laughs) training aids out of because it also depends on the the approach that again that methodology that you're using to make that training aid and so some training aids lend themselves very well to odor adsorption based training aids meaning you know, this, what we call an odor soak. Some work really well with that. And then other ones need like a mimic, like we were saying with methyl benzoate and, and cocaine. And then um, other ones, it's uh, the real thing. Um, and there is no real alternative. Um, and then there's some where we can sort of get away by bridging the gap with a, tra- you know, a commercial off the shelf training aid, but eventually um, I think, and, and I think even OSAC would agree on, on, on this is that, um, if you want to find real, you need to train on real. Um, and so, uh, the, the training, the commercial off the shelf training aids may have their place somewhere along the way in that training, whether it's maintenance or, um, or if they're able to be used for initial imprinting. Um, but at some point you need to work the, uh, the real in there and I'll let Lauren maybe disagree with. Oh yeah. No, I completely agree with you. Um, ideal would be to imprint on very pure, real material when that's available. Um, to answer your first question, I can't fully answer your initial question. I will tell you that HMTD is really, really hard. Um, it, it is a, it's almost like working with human decomposing tissue because the odor changes as it decomposes. Um, and it totally matters how it was made. HMTD is a monster. Uh, making a training aid for that's going to be really, really hard. So, um, and I've done that. I have done papers on, and there is, I have not seen a commercial training aid for HMTD that actually looks like real HMTD yet. So that one's to be aware of. Um, but yeah, like I, something like methyl benzoate, yes, you can imprint the dog on that and they can transfer to cocaine. But until we've shown that with the training aids, they do continue to be better maintenance aids than imprinting just because there's mostly because there is no validation that and it would be you just don't want to imprint the dog on the smell of the silica powder that is the base or some other compound that's just wrong 
that's in the training aid. So you just have to be careful. It's just, unfortunately, I know you guys need it now. And then fortunately, the science is just really far behind. We're very far behind. Nobody really got interested in science for canines until, I don't know, the last decade, maybe 15 years. So we're just, we're way behind you guys. Yeah, we're catching up. And, and I always find it fascinating that, and fascinating in a bad way, that canines are our front line for explosive detection, narcotics detection. They are by far the most sensitive of any of the sort of instruments, if you will, that we have um, deployed or deployable. And they're the only, um, I guess, sensor that has the ability to search and locate and report um, the on the target material, whereas all the other sensors or instruments we have, we have to know where to sample or where to search before. Um, and so given that, it, I find it kind of shocking that we don't have, just like for our gas chromatography and mass spectrometry instruments, like those really fancy instruments in the lab that have calibration standards, like Lauren was talking about, and reagents that are ridiculously pure to make sure that those instruments are you know, properly tuned, if you will, that we don't have those for our dogs. And we, um, I, I think someone said this, I don't remember what conference it was, but that dogs find these, um, these target materials in spite of how, in spite of us, in spite of how poorly we train them. Um, because we give them aids, tra uh, we give them training aids that are almost always contaminated with human scent or mm -hmm. cross-contaminated because they haven't followed Dr. DeGreef's advice about not letting your odors talk to each other. And um, I love that you put it that way. So uh, they haven't done that. And so these, these training aids are cross-contaminated or we don't have access to the, the real thing um, or we don't know what the hell we're doing when we're imprinting and training. Um, and that, that whole process is really noisy because we involve ourselves so much in it and the dogs are queuing off of us and looking for that reinforcement when we should have nothing to do with that first uh, pairing of reinforcement to odor. And so um, I just, I think it's really interesting that um, for any sort of reagent that Lauren would get, she would get a, you know, um, quality assurance and quality control um, certificate of analysis saying this is what exactly is in the stuff that she's buying and we and you know a safety data sheet and we don't really get that for the majority of our canine training aids um, so you know I, I know Lauren and I were talking about a review article and um, it was basically about you know how to evaluate evaluate the utility of a canine training aid um, and I think the research that FIU is doing is really important because they're showing not just what should be in the training aid, but what shouldn't be in the training aid. Um, and that is, you know, when we talk about contaminations or, or contaminants. Um, and then she's also looking at what should be in that training aid, but then um, again, and this is sort of the nuance of how hard it is to make a mimic training aid, is that if you to pick out one of the odorants, let's say, of C4, uh, one of them is 2-ethyl-1-hexanol. And so sometimes people will just pick that one and say, oh, there's my training aid, I got it. But 2-ethyl-1-hexanol is not just present in C4, it's present in a ton of other items that you would encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And so yeah. while you might have had a great mimic training aid for C4 or so you thought, that is going to be problematic in operations when 2-ethyl-1-hexanol is also present in electrical tape. Um, and so then you would start getting false alerts, or I mean, I don't even consider that a false alert, but you would be getting sort of nuisance alerts, if you will, um, in, in real life. So I'm gonna step off my, you know, my horse and my podium right now, but I just wanna say like- Your horse and your podium? Yes, I'm, I'm both of them, because I, I feel like I had a podium on top of a horse, and I'm just going to step down from both of them because you know how amped up I can get about this stuff. Um, but, you know, there's, uh, and, and I guess a lot of this is that I'm frustrated that there's not um, what I believe is an appreciation and proper funding for uh, supporting canine detection in this country, the world, how, you know, wherever we are. Um, well, and, so, I, and I think that falls on us too because the expectation is that these dogs go out and make a football stadium safe for 
uh, you know, 80,000 people yeah. to go watch a game and that we go out and take a dog and make sure that nobody's driving up and down the interstates with, you know, illegal fentanyl in their car and that the dogs are also making sure that if a guy throws a gun out of his car that the dogs have to find that. But you're right, like we're still, and we've been doing this for a long time and we're still trying to find the answers on how to get started. Dude, it's, it's Stone Age stuff. And, and I think part of, and it's not the problem in, in terms of anyone's um, guilty of this, but handlers, trainers make it look so easy to the untrained eye or to the public, right? Like you, you all look like you're just taking a dog on a walk and you're telling the dog search and the dog, you know, finds it, quote unquote. Um, and it looks like kind of magic and it's not magic. It's, there's a ton of science and, and rigor that needs to go into that. Um, and, but the, I think the public is completely unaware of, of all of that. And are just, you know, sort of thankful that it works most of the time, if you will. Right, because you don't know what you're missing, right? When that dog goes for a walk, you don't know what you're missing. But I, I think that the, the takeaway of Michelle's scary rant, potentially, um, is... Don't get me started. The, the dogs, the, I think it was Nathan Hall that says the dogs work despite of us, not because of us. I think it's Nathan that says that. I could be wrong. I'm very sorry if there's a man I'm misquoting. Um, but I think the key is to... Um, imprint on the best thing that you think you have and then as soon as that dog is imprinted show them other versions of it work with your friends get you know don't throw something away because it's contaminated just don't imprint on it use that stuff get the dog as as knowledgeable of different versions of that training aid as possible and then you're going to get there um, and of course there's actual training processes there's cueing and a whole variety of other things on that side but on the odor Purely on the odor side, generalization is key. That's that's you know what that will get you guys to where you need to be. It will help the dogs deal with if fentanyl suddenly comes in a new pill form. That's what is going to um, help your dog work work through that. And um, I didn't bring this up, but we're doing. Um, I have now two students that are working on a contamination study, so we're trying to get a really good idea of how badly do things really get contaminated. Um, and I, and then the answer is, yeah. So when you stick your training aid out in the room, it, if you, there's new carpet, it, it will come home smelling like new carpet. If you hit it under a car, it will come home smelling like, and then you stick a lid on it and then you stick it in the fridge or in your ammo box or wherever you're going to. And now that carpet smell or gasoline smell or whatever is soaked into it. So it's really important to keep that in mind, but I, in an attempt to help, we're also now trying to figure out how, if you can leave that training aid open on your bench for like a half an hour and evaporate off some of that smell so that way your training aid is a little bit less contaminated you're not soaking that odor really deeply into it while you're storing it so um, hopefully we'll have papers out on that in the next six months too if I have my odor in a tad and I put it under a car or if I put it in new carpet there's nothing there that's going to absorb that odor correct not correct not correct Ooh. Yeah, so so some I think there's a couple of misconceptions about the TAD. Some people think it's a one-way airflow, and it is not. Um, and so airflow, again, because that's a gas permeable membrane, is going to work both in both directions. Um, there's okay. pros and cons to that. The pro is that your training aid is getting oxygenated, if you will, like it's getting access to air, and so that replicates more of what would happen in the environment. Um, and the downside to that is that if you trained in a, you know, a California wildfire heavily contaminated environment, you're not going to get particulate and, and ash in there, but you are going to get the VOCs, the, you know, the headspace compounds, the odors that are in the, um, in the air from that. And so that's, you know, another reason why I really like using different types of training aids. Um, so I'm a big fan of odor soaks. And so I like the fact that I can, um, like in a, in a tad, I could put either a get send tube or a piece of filter paper or cotton roll or whatever it is in here when it's closed i'm making a training aid because this training aid is off gassing onto the soak mm -hmm. and then if i don't want like if i have to train in a you know new carpet area or new car smell or whatever it is i don't have to take my training aid and risk it getting 
um, exposed to all of that, I can take out the soak material and use that for my training that day. And then it's disposable, throw it out. I don't have to worry about it. Um, so that's one of the things that I like to do. Soaks have their own issues, as we know, um, because they ha will have selective adsorption for the different <coughs> chemicals um, in the in the headspace, different odorants. And so um, they're not perfect. Uh, but they do um, sort of help bridge that gap, especially if you're, you know, your training environment um, is not conducive to using the real thing. Do you have a uh, favorite mm -hmm. item that you like to use for a soak? Are you using uh, specific like Wattman paper? What, what is your preference for the soaks if you're putting something on the top of the tad? So um, for the top of the tad, I like um, just a piece of Wattman paper. Um, the uh, if I can use there's we made like a 3D printed tad jar connector so that basically you can have like your training aid in the bottom of the the tad mm. next to another thing another jar and then up here you would have all of your um, your different soaks so that it's just sort of off gassing onto the soak material and so I can create like a hundred soaks off of my one training aid um, oh that had oil in it lovely um, so, um, it's one of my testers. Um, so I'm going to smell human like re pepper. human remains. I'm going <laughs> to, so I've, I've tested a few. Yeah. I'm going to, I've tested a handful of soaks. Yeah. I'm going to, um, uh, smell like peppermint for the next week. Um, Dr. DeGrief, do you have a, from that's your, a, you that's said a lot of peppermint. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we've done a few tests. Um, I like for the, I like filter paper. Filter paper is really easy. Um, I also did a full study with human scent, which is a really complex odor profile. I did human scent, living and, um, and cadaver scent and found that the cotton poly blend gauze is good. It has more surface area. So there's more places for the odor to cling than the filter paper. Um, the biggest concern when you're using a soak is try to get cheap material so you can toss it because you don't know how long that odor is going to be on there. And if you train to that same soak over and over and over again, over a period of time, eventually that odor goes away. And eventually you're just training the dog to find the gauze pad or whatever. Um, and you can't, there's no visual way to tell when that happens. And the dog is learning the game every single time you put that soak out. So you might not be able to tell from the way the dog is. It's not like one day it has a full odor and then day four so day one two and three it's full odor soak and then day four there's no odor there and your dog is like nope there's no odor it's going down and so eventually it's getting low and your dog is really starting to pick up the odor of that substrate so anyway that was a long way to say try to use soaks that you can pitch and or or recharge yeah i, I think that's super <laughs> which without ones can you recharge <laughs> I mean, you can put, I'm just saying, if you don't want to throw, for whatever reason, if you don't want to throw it away, you can you put the same put filter paper or the same gauze pad back in. It doesn't solve the contamination issue. Right. Um, if you throw it away, it solves both the depletion and the contamination issue. But if for some reason you can't throw it away, you can always stick it back in the headspace of that tad and it will yeah. recharge. So I'll just recharge. say without having studied this stuff, um, and the, the gauze that Lauren's referring to is Ducal gauze, D-U-K-A-L. Is that right? I don't think that, I think it's Band-Aid it's band brand now. They got rid of Ducal. I think Band-Aid bought Ducal. Okay. All right. So the band, I think it's the Band-Aid brand. Okay. But most of the gauzes on the market are, um, if they don't say they're mostly cotton poly blend, it usually says if it's pure cotton. Yeah. Um, so the... Um, Oh, without having ha had studied all of the different types of odor soaks um, like Lauren has, from sort of um, my perspective is that I know just from, you know, research even, even Lauren and I have done together is that different odorants, so different VOCs have different adsorption coefficients. And so I know this is going to get super nerdy and sciencey, but the easiest way to describe that is that certain of um, some of our training aids are stickier than others. And so they want to stick to things. And um, oh, yeah. that's, that's what that adsorption coefficient is. And so that is going to be odorant dependent. So um, like RDX is really hard for Lauren to sort of wash or purge out of her instruments because it likes to stick. 
where I know. And um, TNT. Right, and TNT, right? So there's a couple of things that are really sticky, and it depends on the odorant and what it's sticking to. So the surface also matters, like if it's, you know, glass or plastic or metal. So that gets real, those interactions, those surface interactions get very, very complex. Um, and that's why when we're talking about odor soak substrates, like whether it's cotton or, or gauze or a get scent tube um, or filter paper, all of those different substrates are made of different materials and they're going to have slightly different um, attraction to the, the odors and vice versa. The odors are going to have different sort of attraction coefficients or attraction to the substrate. So that's why I like yeah. mixing up the substrates for my odor soaks because I don't know what they're attaching to in the headspace. And I feel like I'm getting um, a better representation of the headspace if I can use a bunch of different soaks. It also makes it more complicated because then I have to train off of most of those things. But um, that's yeah. an, one of the things I like to, to do. That's actually one of the reasons why the cotton poly blend is good because it has different it's it's a blend yeah in itself yeah you know if anybody who's listening to this hasn't fallen asleep from all the science yet and really wants to nerd out michelle and i did write an entire book chapter on this subject which can be seen which was fun where where can we get it's called the book is called canines the original biosensor and um i want to say it's chapter eight there we go if i were to guess and it's like I don't remember the title, something about chemistry of odor. Well, and we're almost to the end. Well, we're at the end of our hour, but on that same note, we have a sponsor hits uh, seminar that's happening in August. Uh, and both of you have said that you're going to be there. Michelle, it sounds like you're not teaching there, but you're just hanging out. So if you want to come hang out with Michelle, Michelle will be there. I imagine at the bar. Safe to find uh, you there. Yes. Is, okay. I heard that. Okay. I heard that it hits. There's, the hotel has a lazy river outside. I heard the same thing. Ted Doss. Uh, That's no, great. Ted, Ted, I'm there for like seven days. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to freak out. Like I am going to be Great Wolf lodging it up with a martini or whatever is in a city. You know it's like going to be like 115 degrees outside. Right? Don't care, Lauren. I'm going to come out looking like a, lob, a drunk lobster. And it's going to be the freaking best. I cannot wait for this. On a uh, more helpful tip, Dr. DeGrief <laughs> will be there and will actually be instructing. Uh, do you know what you are going to be teaching during uh, HITS? I believe I am teaching um, uh, odor chemistry for explosives and um, a class also on emerging threats, which we're going to hit on HMEs and fentanyl and good stuff like that. And um, the HITS people also are doing Smart Dog, and I am teaching some things there <laughs> i think i'm teaching about human remains i believe there as well as i want to say something for nose work people i should have looked those both up that's all right <laughs> sorry so oh. so once again uh hits Lauren, is a sponsor for us basically i'm moving to arizona that yeah. sounds sorry. Like once again hits as a sponsor for us we're really happy to have them as a sponsor and we're looking forward to that seminar and uh like you just said, if you haven't fallen asleep and this hour has been interesting to you, we can continue on in person with uh, Dr. DeGrief in the classroom or uh, with Michelle in the river. Yes, the lazy river. <laughs> Can't wait. Hey, uh, it has been awesome having you guys on. I feel like, I'm not going to lie, I feel slightly more confused. So we'll we just scratch the surface. Yeah. I know that's the problem. Our, our job here uh, is done, Lauren. Our job here is done. <laughs> mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. i mean i, I feel like generalization have, i feel yes. yes and that's the one thing that we have going for us generalization yes is is with greg's groups they cross over with their with their odors yeah. uh with you know that's key yeah. yeah and it's nice that the dogs are able to generalize yep yeah. and generalization. Do uh, dr singletary from auburn university said this uh this past week at a military working dog symposium and said just like humans with dogs variety is the spice of life and so as much as you can vary training environments, training aids, all that good stuff, um, you will be setting your dog up for success. Awesome. That's good information to have. And uh, the hard thing is, is if you're a small group, if you're a one agency and you're by yourself in the middle of nowhere, you have to travel and find another group and use their aids. Yeah, 100%. And for you handlers out there, like if you have not 
taken your training aids and sent them in to be laboratory tested and know exactly what's in there, like you could have some issues. And I've, I've talked to um, people that attack uh, canine handlers on the stand, and that's one of the areas they go to. They go, well, let's see what your dog was imprinted on, and do you have the printout of exactly the, you know, the different odors that were in that, you know, yeah, it tested blue. At least I'm dating yeah, myself yeah, yeah, maybe right, here, right? right. right. <laughs> when you're testing for meth, it tested blue, so you know meth is in here, but what else is in there, right? right. And I think that's, right. that's, that gets to the heart of the matter as well. So, And then we mentioned Watman paper, W-H-A-T-M-A-N. That's what we use for the filter paper. And then, um, and then this is new for me, honestly, is, is what you, you guys were talking about, about using the, um, the polycotton gauze. Yeah, polycotton gauze. And, and I like that, and that's maybe something we're going we're gonna to add as well. So, like, those are great training tips. If you get nothing else out of this, like, that's, that's stuff to take home. If you home. get nothing else out of it, you probably turn it off by now. <laughs> <laughs> we're well, going to have to put that on the front end. That's going to be the teaser. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, and, okay, think, yeah. and it's a good place for people to go. I mean, the reality is, is a lot of handlers don't even know that your job exists. They just think that their dog goes out and finds stuff. There's not a whole lot of us. We're very hidden. <laughs> not anymore. We're exposing y'all. Thank you guys for being yeah. patient with us, um, making the words a lot smaller. That's thanks helpful. for dumbing it down for me. Yeah, yeah, I needed I really, it for sure. And, me, and, really. and, and, and thanks for doing what you do because it's important for us. We've gone a long time, like everybody else, just assuming that our dog finds stuff, not really knowing everything behind it. We try as hard as we can to understand the science and do everything the right way. Having you guys there to police this is very important to our industry, and we appreciate you. 100%. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you, and thanks for having us. Thank right. you. Take care. In the meantime, train hard and be safe. <laughs>